Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, presentation of the National Archives Assembly. Um, we're very pleased to have uh, Mr. Uh, Meyer Fishbein here. Uh, the National Archives Assembly is an employee organization dedicated to fostering communication and employee development throughout NARA. Um, one of our uh, initiatives has been to advocate for a NARA historian position, and we're pleased that that position was filled in 2012 by Jesse Kratz, and uh, I'll introduce her, and if she could come up and say hi, and introduce the speakers. Thank you, and welcome to this program. Um, uh, this program sort of came out of Rod, a brainchild of Rod. We were um, talking about um, my new website that I put together for the National Archives History Office, and I had been putting together bi biographies of all the past archivists, and he mentioned that he had known Meyer, and Meyer knew pretty much all the archivists. He thought it would be a great program to bring Meyer in and kind of bring all these past archivists to life. Um, Rod has been a great mentor to me, a great friend, a great colleague, and I'm so excited to introduce him, Rod Ross, from Legislative Archives, interviewing Meyer Fishbein. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse, thank you. and thank you, Matt. Uh, so I'm Rod Ross, an archivist with the Center for Legislative Archives. In the mid-1980s, I did some oral history interviews, partly to document the uh, independence movement, and Meyer was one of the people that I talked with. So in recent months, I've uh, redeveloped a friendship with Meyer. What I want to do today, since you know, we're being recorded, um, is basically give some understanding of some of the controversies, some of the key people, and especially Meyer's role here at the National Archives. So for the initial interview that I did in 1985, copies of which in the cassette is available upstairs, I started out at the very beginning and worked our way through Meyer's career. What I wanted to do today is pretty much jump to the center part of his career and then you know, his coming on to the appraisal unit, then move on to one of his great accomplishments of being responsible for bringing electronic records, machine readable records, as accessioned records at the National Archives, and then talk about his continuing role with the appraisal division. So Meyer, let's start out in the early 1960s you're a branch chief for business economics records. No, no, no that was, uh, yes, that's right, yeah. Okay, then you become, you get tapped by Theodore Schellenberg to come into the new appraisal unit. Let's start out by what background did you have with agency records? Who was Schellenberg? and why did the archives have yet another reorganization with Schellenberg, head of appraisal? Well, uh, my earliest experience was uh, packing and shelving the records of the NRA. That's not the National Rifle Association. It's the National Recovery Administration. Uh, it was uh, a uh, agency that didn't last long, but was declared unanimously unconstitutional uh, by the Supreme Court, but they had accumulated more information about the economy of a nation that, that existed any, anywhere in, in, in the world. Uh, but the records were, uh, were going to be destroyed. Harold Ickes, Secretary of the Interior, decided save money, just incinerate the records but the National Archives was, was established and uh, stopped the uh, destruction, which was very fortunate because the records were very valuable uh, during the Second World War. They needed the same information that the NRA collected, but most of the records had been dumped in, into cartons, and so they were completely mixed up and, and put on open shelves. And, but some of the records were organized, and my first job really was to just put them in boxes. 
but I uh, became familiar, I don't know whether to talk about the, uh, uh, the first request that I got, all right. Well, let's, you know, for, for purposes of clarification, you know, Meyer joined the archives in 1940. Yeah. He got assigned to what was sometimes called the ghetto, which was the division headed by Paul Lewinson. And uh, in the audience, we have a lawyer from Washington, Paul Paschal, whose father, Leo, was also in that same unit. So before, let, let's, let's still get to, to what I really want to talk about. And then we have yeah. approximately 40 minutes. We'll yeah. come on back. So basically take questions from the audience, as well as once we go through the stellar points of your career, go back and talk about the personalities of some mm -hmm. of the archivists. Yeah. But let's start out with the personality. Who was Ted Schellenberg? Uh, Ted Schellenberg uh, was a uh, uh, expert, uh, uh, very knowledgeable about agriculture. He, he got his uh, PhD from, from UPenn uh, and worked uh, uh, briefly for the Park Service but uh, his main interest was ag agricultural history, so that when he came to the National Archives, uh, at, at, he was a, a deputy examiner, that I could explain if you want. Uh, uh, he would go to the agriculture department to, 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 to find out what records deserve uh, preservation. And he reported uh, to Dorsey Hyde, who was uh, uh, the director of accessions, as I explained to the office of the United States, that was actually the equivalent of uh, assistant archivist uh, for the National Archives, because accessioning was the only program. Uh, but uh, he reported. He and Paul Lewinson, who, who was examining the Labor Department records, found big files of uh, punch cards. And when, when they reported it to Dorsey Hyde, he said he completely ignored them. And I, when I heard about it years later, I said, that doesn't make any sense at all. You just don't ignore it. Why, is it being, why are they being retained? And, uh, uh, do they still have the paper records that uh, explain what, what's on the punch cards and what has been done with them? Uh, so it's completely ignoring them was uh, a very uh, unfortunate decision at the time. It was cleared up later. I don't so know so once again, for that. Schellenberg, he eventually gained an international reputation with archival management. How did that come about? Yeah, well, uh, he, uh, he, he uh, got a consultantship in, in Australia and published the first of his books on, on archival uh, management. He did two uh, internationally known books on uh, uh, ma archival management, uh, but he, he didn't get along, unfortunately with the top brass. They didn't know what to do about him. He was very vocal uh, on his disdain f for them, which I think was quite unfortunate. But uh, Schellenberg had some per personality problems uh, that unfortunately uh, had some negative effects. Uh, but uh, I got along well with him. Uh, on the job, but he completely ignored me outside the good job. So a couple of things that come to mind in your, your speaking. One, you said it would be uh, the late 50s, early 60s, the archives had yet another reorganization. And uh, the archivist and his deputy, Wayne Grover and Bob Boehmer, yeah. decided to go function instead of uh, record division agency, and they created the appraisal unit either to get rid of uh, Schellenberg or to give him 
that place because they thought that he would be the best to develop. How did you end up getting onto Schellenberg's well, staff? Well, uh, I, I first realized that reorganization within, within the works, I was called by Bob Boehmer uh, to lunch with the executive director and to ask me what I thought, first of all, with Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was, a, was one of the scholars in the archives, what I thought of his management style. And I said, I wouldn't talk about him behind his back, and so I wouldn't say anything. But it indicated to me that something was up in reorganization. Uh, and it was very shortly after that it was reorganized. And uh, to find an, appro an appropriate job for Schellenberg, uh, uh, and, but to get him a, a, away from the t top staff, they made him uh, a, a, a director of the office, what was then called the Office of, of Records Appraisal. And uh, it was a, around Christmas, week, Christmas weekend. Uh, there was a party at, at, at the, uh, uh, in the conference room and he shook my hand and uh, then later said, the people's hand I shook ought to be working for me. For personal reasons, it, it ruined my weekend, but it was the most, um, most fortunate thing that happened to me. Okay, so you come on board. You end up having census as one of the agencies that you're going off to review. When you did go, leading us into your huge recognized claim to fame of being the person responsible for having the archives treat machine-readable records as any other kind of federal record to be accessioned. How did that part come about? Well, uh, when uh, Schellenberg started the Office of Records Appraisal, he had uh, about, I've forgotten the size of the staff, about 10 at most. Uh, we sat around a table and and Schellenberg said, Let, let's talk about what we're gonna be doing. And he says, he thinks there's a, we ought to do something to instead of just looking at records at random, that, that we decide what records should be retained and just ignore the rest and tell the agency to get rid of them whenever they're no longer in, in, needed for operating purposes. Well, that sounded like a great idea to me, so I says, well, uh, why don't I try, ex, uh, try it out at the Census Bureau? And uh, I drew up a plan for uh, retained records. And I, this was 1963. I went over to the Census Bureau to see if, if the plan would work. And I came upon an odd looking uh, room. It was a big glass window. Uh, narrow w with little cubby holes with things in the cubby holes. And I said, well, what is that? He says, that's our tape library. Well, what's a tape library? He said, well, they were experimenting about the use of uh, uh, machine readable, actually, uh, or now known as electronic. Uh, and they experimented with wire tape with wire, uh, electronic wire, uh, uh, and uh, it didn't work very well. And they, they switched to what was then called mylar tape. And I said, well, uh, what are you gonna do with it? He says, we're gonna erase it. I says, why are you gonna erase it? Well, we don't, we, we don't need it anymore. And if we erase it, we can reuse it and save $12.50. And I said, no, you can't do that. Those are records. You can't just decide to throw them out. Uh, they have to be appraised. I went back to the archives. At that time, so I went back. Uh, at the, by that time, Schellenberg ha didn't last long in that position. He just quit. He couldn't get along with the, with the top staff. And Lou Dotter be became head, and it was then called appraisal division. I went back to Dotter and said, we have to do something about uh, this 
mylar tape that agencies are creating. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he reported that to Bob Bamer, the archivist, uh, and uh, there was a, uh, shortly after that, I don't know if it's worth mentioning, a, a committee from the Social Science Research Council, uh, a, a committee of, of economists to ask what the National Archives is gonna do about machine readable records. Uh, meantime, I ran around, tried to find out all I can. I went to Ann Arbor, uh, to social science uh, uh, or, uh, organization where they had social science and political data all, all on cards. And I, said, I asked them, what are you gonna do with it? He says, well, we're gonna take the cards and convert them to tape. Uh, and so I, I proposed that we, we decide what to do about it, about, about the electronic records. And, and the people in the National Archives uh, thought I was some kind of a nut. It had nothing to do with, they said it's nothing to do with archives. And I disagreed with them, but as a result of that, Daughter uh, made me uh, assistant director of the division uh, he wasn't a well man, uh, and when he retired, I became division director, and I spent a good deal of my time trying to figure out how to handle it. I worked with the, the records management people at the National Archives. Ev Aldrich was the director, one of the sharpest guys uh, in, in the institution, a tough boss, and we worked together on, on, on developing uh, questionnaires about uh, uh, gathering information on, on, on each file, uh, what it contained, what uses it has, what, what uses have been made of it, and whether the information is worth keeping. I said, if it's worth keeping, we'll find some way to, to preserve it. Uh, but the most important thing is to decide whether it's, it's of enduring value. Uh, and, then, and then we figure out how to handle it in the future. And so the, the, there was, we had a depository in Alexandria. And they decided that, to, uh, any that, that the agency had retired but was still valuable was sent to uh, Alexandria. Uh, how much more of that you want to know? Uh, well, you said Rod. that eventually the archives did decide to accession electronic records. Yeah, yeah, and the, the, yeah. So if we can talk about that, and then how was it that you became the promotional person for the Society of American Archivists for other archival agencies in this country doing the same? I mean, my, my other, uh, well, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, w what I was doing was uh, ha had a full-scale uh, appraisal of, of records, uh, followed up on, on census. What I did with census, I took my original draft, added another chapter uh, t to my uh, uh, plan for retention of records and added a section on uh, what we then called machine readable records, which of course became uh, completely electronic over time. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the, fortunately the records, I knew the records manager at Census, and he went, he, uh, went, went along uh, with my proposals and accepted them. My other big job was working with the, with, with the FBI in a retention plan, uh, which was an unusual. I don't know if that's any interest. Well, you mentioned taking in Emma Goldman materials. Yeah, well, what happened with, uh, with the FBI, they wouldn't let me look, even though I had top secret clearance, they wouldn't let me look at any records. But in any case, I just gave them a retention plan uh, and it wasn't long after that I was called to a meeting. There must have been about five uh, top-rated FBI staff, uh, and the meeting was he was direct was uh, chaired by an assistant 
director of the FBI. They said they assigned it to a, uh, a senior FBI agent who, 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 who was there at the meeting, and he said he went around, found files that he didn't know existed, and he says he learned a great deal about uh, J. Edgar Hoover's plans in 1924 about the agency. He says, and since then, that whole plan is, uh, is, was still in effect, but he, he hadn't known it until he found the records. And what he, what he produced was a big stack of papers describing every uh, file worth retaining and asked me what I thought of it. I went through it. It was a great job, and I said that. He says, well, that's the last time you're going to see it. Uh, and it was, was, after that, I got uh, Christmas cards every year from uh, J. Edgar Hoover. But I don't know, there was an, I had a fight with the agency, I'll say. Well, how did, how did it happen that you got, you said Emma Goldman records? Yeah, what happened, uh, I had a brief fight with the FBI uh, in between. They accused me of uh, saving a file on investigations of members of Congress. Uh, when, when he told that to, when L. Patrick Gray told that to Congress, I was very angry, picked up the phone and, and raised heck. That said, oh, Mr. Fishbein, no, he didn't mean that. Uh, but uh, it, they said, uh, you had acted very, very properly. They, they had asked me, about, should I mention why, that, why they accused me? Well, I still wanted to get into, so the, ar the archives accessioned machine readable records. Yeah. And then the, you got a, a chairmanship with the SAA basically promoting access, you know, electronic records, correct? Yeah. How did that come about? Uh, accessioning? Well, how did it happen that you became basically the national point person for promotion of electronic records, accessioning by archival agencies. Uh, uh, how I got there? Right. Who? How? How did you become the the SAA point person? Uh, uh, for electronic. Well, the thing is, uh, I, I, I was just in appraisal. I uh, I didn't have to manage this. All I had to decide is whether the records should be preserved or not. Uh, but I thought I had to de develop a, a system of, of appraisal for electronic records. And I, uh, with the help of a few people, I developed a, a questionnaires, a for forms uh, for the agencies to fill out and f describing each file and, uh, and uh, what paper records are kept in order to be able to read the, the electronic records. Uh, but uh, I had a, a close relationship with the records management staff uh, who uh, actually uh, uh, managed uh, the, the, who worked with the agencies on uh, 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 disposal of, of all records, in, including electronic records. And so I just, oh, I, uh, actually, uh, my role in, in effect ended, uh, except for um, my role uh, as uh, with the International Council on Archives when I was made a chairman of, a, of an international committee on, on automation. <laughs> And you said that was an eight-year commitment on your part? Was it? Did you say that that was eight-year commitment? Yeah, yeah, I got a cable from Paris asking me whether I would be chairman of, of a task force on, on uh, machine-readable records. And uh, Ernst Posner told, said, you have to go, uh, you, you're obliged to go. <laughs> and the National Archives didn't do anything for me but I got, a, I got a grant from the Council of, of Library Resources who, who paid my expenses, and we had our first meeting in Spoleto Whitley. Okay, let's go back a little bit. 
you were head of appraisal when made Jean Daniels in her 1995 presidential address lauding you and um, Leonard Rappaport. She mentioned you know, the use of retention schedules. Is that something that, that be, was unique to you? Had Schellenberg developed them? And then where does it fit in with the elimination of Congress giving its approval for the destruction of useless records? Yeah, well, uh, uh, what happened, uh, the, you know, the old system was uh, the National Archives uh, would receive requests for, for disposal of records. We would make our recommendations. Presumably, uh, Congress, a joint committee of, of the Senate uh, and the House uh, would make the decision. It, it was really managed by the House of Representatives rather than the Senate, but there was a joint committee. Uh, and uh, the uh, Congress, in effect, was more or less rubber stamping our proposals until one member of Congress from California said, I'm not going to approve it. I don't understand what you're doing. And uh, so I, at that time, records were piling up and, and they kept blaming me for not being able to dispose of records. I said, sitting in the hallway, sitting in the basement, why don't you get on the ball? I said, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I went to the Hill. I said, what's holding this up? And they told me the congressman refused. They said, well, let me talk to him. No, you can't talk to him. He just won't approve it. So, uh, so the House proposed a bill uh, to uh, change the system and get Congress out of it. The House bill uh, was completely unworkable. Uh, they said they would give us a give the archives a chance to uh, to discuss any pro any proposed bill. They did the House didn't do it. They just passed it. Uh, Unfortunately, when it got to the Senate, uh, the Senate uh, uh, sent, at uh, that time we were still attached to GSA, said the GSA, uh, well, y if you have any questions about this bill, uh, let us know. Well, it went through GSA uh, to, to the National Archives and came to me, and they, I said, you have one hour to, to uh, go over the, the House bill. And I said, it's unworkable. And I quickly uh, wrote the bill out, uh, changing the system. Uh, I made one uh, caveat that we would not be responsible for uh, disposal of GSA records. I didn't want to get involved. I figured GSA is, is full of fraud. Uh, well, the Senate eliminated that, accepted the, accepted the rest of the bill. Of course, uh, it didn't make any sense uh, to, uh, to uh, make a, a distinction of a GSA. And it, it was clear to me how a system would work. So that if there's any improper disposal of records, I, I would be fired. Okay, so basically the, the National Archives developed retention schedules yeah. instead of simply having Congress approve yeah. lists of, of useless yeah. records. Yeah. So we, we, what would you say your key accomplishment was being with appraisal and how did your job with appraisal end? Why did it end? Well, uh, well, you know, I, I enjoyed everything I did. Uh, uh, that change in, in the disposal procedure, eliminating Congress, uh, uh, was something I just dashed off. Uh, as far as appraisal is concerned, I, that I think what was, what was a major plan. The whole idea of it was that we would make a, uh, we would decide what records would be kept permanently and let the agency decide to, to do what what it can, what it wished with, with the rest of the records. Well, uh, uh, GSA sent uh, Brett Rose a note that uh, not, 
enough records that were being destroyed without discussing it with me, Burt Rhodes uh, uh, terminated the appraisal division, which more or less brought disposal to complete halt because the rest of the archives couldn't care less about disposal of records. Okay, and then Bert basically said, where do you want to go, Meyer? And you ended up your career as head of military archives? Yeah. It, you know, I had a fight with Bert Rhodes about his, his management style. Uh, and uh, he should have demoted me. It, in a similar position, that's what I would have done. But somehow, really, he thought I had clout with, with economists and, and historians. That, that clout really was of no importance. They couldn't have done anything if, if I had been demoted. Uh, I, I, when, when, when someone, uh, one of my branch chiefs, uh, well, uh, it, it, uh, acted improperly to me, cursed me, I temporarily removed them from his job to show them uh, there's this one boss. Uh, but Bert Rhodes thought I had clout. And so he said, you know, what job do you want? Uh, obviously, I, I should have said, I want your job. Uh, but uh, the uh, military archives, uh, there was no division chief. Mabel Dietrich, who was uh, director of the military archives, was, was moved up to uh, assistant uh, archivist for, for the National Archives. And so I, uh, I thought it would be a, a real challenge to me. S civil, the civil division would have been easy for me, but uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Smith, uh, who had been running that division. Right, was, Jane Smith. Yeah, you know, she, was, she was a nice person, and I just couldn't say I want her job. I, that w I would never do that to her. She was very nice. So I took the military. Uh, I thought it would be a challenge to me, but it turned out to be a, a management headache uh, and completely unsatisfactory. Now before we go into the personalities of the various archivists you've known, you mentioned that uh, Bob Boehmer had come on board, or Bob Warner, rather, and he said to you, Meyer, we're going to reinvestigate appraisal, and that's about the point where you decided, I don't think so, and you resigned? No, no, that was with Warner. Well, right. Wasn't that his name? Right, Bob Warner. Yeah. Uh, he kept talking to me about uh, what uh, jobs I could take. I said, I've done all of that. Uh, and then I, uh, it was a Christmas party, and I was wishing somebody who was retiring from repair and preservation good luck. And I says, what the heck am I doing here? That was Christmas week. I went down, give me that piece of paper, I'm through. Okay, so that ends your career. Let's, let's go back to talking about personalities of the early archivist. Yeah. So you came on in 1940 in the lowest of low positions having been um, come from New York as a clerk in census, got a yeah, job yeah, in the I archives. I was in Washington. And um, R.D.W. Connor was archivist. You had mentioned that just about the time you came on board, the battle between librarians and historians had ended. Do you want to talk a little bit about that battle? About the, yeah, about, about the, <clears throat> the war. Uh, uh, the head of, uh, of accessions, uh, Hyde, Dorsey Hyde, uh, Rutgers, uh, he was, uh, his, most of his career was working in various libraries. And he thought he would, if very clearly, he would use cataloging and classification uh, for uh, describing and organizing archives. Uh, he said he would show how well it worked with the, with the records of the, food, of the World War I Food Administration. It was an absolute disaster, but he wouldn't give up 
In the meantime, other records are coming in with nobody to describe them. Uh, and so there were Schellenberg, uh, Lewinson, and, and probably Dallas Irvine, who was expert on military records. He had a military career. He was kicked out of West Point, uh, who uh, were objecting to, to, the, to the decisions by Dorsey Hyde. And it wasn't only his, his, his failure to understand archives uh, management, uh, but his decisions on appraisal uh, didn't make any sense to them. Eventually, the deputy archivist, th th those were very good appointments by, by Connor. He, unfortunately, for his two top jobs, he didn't pick people who were well qualified. Uh, Marcus Price and Dorsey Hyde but he made good appointments for, for deputy examiners, the people who went into the agencies uh, uh, to find the permanently valuable records. Uh, and uh, uh, th so they rose up against the librarians and, uh, and it, it kind of brought uh, the archives to a stop. Congress uh, dis discovered that and uh, it made Connor uh, in a position that was untenable. And so Connor had to resign and go to the manuscripts the, uh, division of the uh, Library of Congress and became president of North Carolina University. He, he was the perfect Southern uh, gentleman. Uh, and I, when I first came to the archives, I thought it was a kind of a gentleman's club. If you saw the movie Gentleman's Agreement, you might understand that. Yeah, I, I was taken when you said that you got hired because the Civil Service Commission oh, yes. was not happy with the National Archives. Yeah, there was an investigation uh, by the Civil Service Commission because the National Archives was completely ignoring the Civil Service uh, requirements. Uh, the background to that is there was no standards for archivists, and so Connor uh, would have to develop his own standards for uh, 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 accepting uh, uh, archivists, appointing archivists. Uh, but unfortunately, he thought he could uh, fill all positions without regard to civil service. Well, uh, this was in, in the upper, upper uh, 30s about 1937, I believe. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, so uh, the, ar the, for the archives felt they had to use uh, uh, people certified uh, by examinations who were acceptable to the civil service system. And so uh, one of the reasons I was hired, I, I came off of, a, a list that happened to be the list for uh, assistant messengers. Now, I was taken that basically when you had your interview, you had the impression that the interviewer did not like Jews, and yet you were appointed, and then you had a theory why you got appointed. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, I don't know if, this, if they still have the same rule the Office of Personnel Management, uh, but they usually they submitted three names. Uh, so, uh, and uh, my, my bad interview uh, with the head of repair and preservation, I was quite surprised uh, to be offered a job. And the only thing I could figure is that uh, the other two must have been African Americans uh, uh, and so, and so I was selected as, uh, uh, as the best of, th of three poor choices. You know, one, one of the things that's most impressed me in talking with you is how you've seized opportunities for promotion with this agency. You know, you meant you were assigned to what was sometimes called the ghetto. Was that because it had a preponderance of Jews? 
And yeah, well, how did Paul Lewinson fit in? Well, I, uh, it, 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 you know, when, when I mentioned that to Paul Lewinson, he looked at me as if he didn't understand what I was talking about. Of course he understood. Uh, Leo Pascal was there. And uh, t to show uh, a, a good example, there was a, uh, an appointee who came from Brooklyn with a name that could have been uh, Jewish. And so he was assigned to uh, Lewinson. As it turned out, he, he was a hot Irishman. The, the, the name came from a Austrian grandfather. And he, he would go into Paul Lewinson with a big button that's America first. I don't know if that name is familiar to you. Uh, Charles Lindbergh was w one of the leaders, uh, right wing. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so he was assigned to Lewinson, and assume, what, assuming he was Jewish. What was Lewinson's subject area, and you know, the, the, and the various people under him there, in your subject area? Well, uh, Lewinson had, had quite quite a, a career. Uh, he uh, coming out of uh, out of high school. Uh, he was awarded a uh, a, a grant by uh, the by Pulitzer, the publisher of the New York World, because he was so outstanding in Latin. Uh, Pulitzer paid for all his his expenses at Columbia University, and uh, then uh, he uh, went to in about 1926, I think. He went to the London School of, e of Economics uh, as his wife, uh, Jean Flexner. Probably that name Flexner doesn't mean anything, but if you look up Abraham Flexner, considered one of the most influential men in the United States. Uh, she's, as she said, as a historian, he's an excellent economist. And so that's why he, he, he was the one who, who grabbed the National Recovery Administration records when it should have gone to the people who were specializing in, in the records of the Commerce Department under a, 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 someone named Cummings, uh, who was a nice guy, but not particularly outstanding. See, I want to let uh, the audience ask questions, but before, let's talk about the personalities of Solon Buck versus Grover versus Boehmer, and then we'll, we'll open it up for audience. So how would you describe each of those three men? Uh, Solon Buck, uh, well, uh, his major publication was on the farm revolt in, in the Midwest, uh, in the, that, that farm revolt in the upper part of the uh, 20th, uh, of the 19th century. Uh, and he had a great demand for, for scholarship. He wanted, uh, he wanted uh, his staff to publish, uh, and uh, he was, and so when I was up for a promotion, he turned me down because I, I, I didn't have enough, enough education. He told me he was sacrificing me because some of the top people weren't any good which struck me as the very oddest reason for denying me a promotion, but a, a little over a month later, he approved it. Uh, he, uh, when I was in the army in England, a cable arrived from, from Solon Buck, uh, thanking me for my contributions on the publication of World War, this is World War I, agencies and their records. It made a great impression on them. It didn't make much of an impression on me. Well, you said on, on your, your army super, super, superiors. Was it? You said that, that the receipt of that cable made an impression on your army superiors. Yeah, yeah, oh yes. They were very impressed, uh, even though I was told I would never get a promotion because I wanted to hit a lieutenant in the buildup for D-Day. Uh, when uh, headquarters asked for someone to uh, B-52 
be there. This was the preparation for, for, for the, the landing in France. Uh, I, was, I was sent, and when they were told to have some, to give it a, a lecture on the Japanese military, uh, I didn't know it at the time. We were scheduled to go from Europe uh, to the Pacific without, without stopping in the United States. So I said, well, what am I going to talk about? He says, well, talk about the Japanese military. Well, I didn't know anything about Japanese, but they gave me a big package of stuff. He says, how long do you want me to talk? He says, well, three hours. I actually talked for two and a half hours without notes. <laughs> So that's a result of Solon Buck's cable. So I do want to get into Wayne Grover and Bob Boehmer, but before I do, are there any questions from those here in the audience? And Meyer, you mentioned Leonard Rappaport, who wrote a beautiful obituary for my father. Yeah. Can you add anything about Leo Pascal? Well, uh, uh, I, I, I met uh, Pascal, of course, the, the day I arrived. Uh, at, at the National Archives. I was introduced to every one of them except Mary Walton Livingston, which I need to explain or not. And uh, so I, I was working, I was assigned to, to work with, with Leo Pascal, and he was show, showing me the, the ropes, uh, and we became, uh, as you know, <laughs> a very good friends. He, he, he had taken the ex history exam. Finally, the, the archives ha had some way of, uh, of approving uh, candidates uh, for the National Archives, and they, they used a, an examination on, on American history. And Leo uh, was excellent on, on remembering names of, of people in American history that I knew nothing, <laughs> knew nothing about. Uh, he did very, he did well on it, but the archives was, did not uh, uh, appreciate a, a Pascal's uh, hard work. Uh, I, I, I sort of pressed for that uh, for him, uh, but but he was very slow in, in get, getting promotions. He had uh, a, a degree uh, from. Uh, uh, Cleveland, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the university's name? I, sh I should remember it. Western uh, Reserve. Huh? Western, Western Reserve. Reserve, yeah. So thank you, uh, for, uh, but uh, it was unfortunate somehow or other that they didn't appreciate how hard uh, Pascal worked. So to conclude with Leo Pascal, what did he do at the archives? Who? Leo Pascal. Oh yeah, uh, he was working with me. Uh, I, uh, for for a, a long time, for various reasons, I worked exclusively on uh, National Recovery Administration, which was very fortunate because we had a lot of economists. I saw more economists than I saw of historians in the early days, and that, and that eventually led uh, to my becoming chief, or what was then called the the business economics branch. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, okay. uh, Let, let's let's move on since I want to cover at least the two archivists, Wayne Grover and Bob Boehmer. But I do see there is a question. Yeah. Sorry, Rick Klondo. Why were you falsely accused of taking that FBI file on members of Congress? You were going to explain earlier. Oh, okay. Want me to explain that? Yeah, I can explain it. I got a call uh, from the FBI. They said they have a file, and uh, they uh, want to get rid of it. Can they just throw it out with, without going through the paperwork? So I said, well, can you say this is within the jurisdiction, within the, the law, the FBI uh, authority? I said, yes, but we don't want the file. It's, it's, it's in New York. I said, no, I says, if you're in a hurry to dispose of it, I'll, I'll give it priority and send it. That time, we're still going through Congress. Uh, I said, I'll, 
I'll, I'll, I'll rush it. If, if it's disposable, I'll quickly get rid of it. Uh, and, okay, a day or two later, I got a call. Said, Mr. Fishbein, let me understand that we have to go through normal procedures. I said, listen to me. I said, if you want to destroy records illegally, don't involve me. And that was the end of my conversation. Well, Congress found out about the, law, about the file, and he said it's the fault of the archives. So he was blaming me. I didn't even know what the records were. He, well, I got angry, and I called, and he said, oh, Mr. Fishbein, you, you, what, you, you were very, what you did was very appropriate and proper. He said, but he didn't mean to it. He didn't mean to involve me. But uh, it, it resulted in my having excellent relations with, with the FBI and that, <laughs> the Emmett Goldman business. Okay, so we're finally going to get to Wayne Grover and Bob Boehmer. Oh, Rob, yeah. Who uh, were they uh, and what did they do? Uh, uh, Wayne uh, was, was from Utah, a moment. Uh, he, uh, he started that as a, I think it was a CPA, uh, he started that as a, as a kind of a clerk at the National Archives, uh, actually, at, uh, actually at, at exactly the same grade as I. It, w it would have been the equivalent of, of a GS-1. Uh, uh, he, he worked briefly on the Hill and uh, he ended up marrying uh, the uh, daughter of, of, of a senator who was high up uh, in the hierarchy. And I think that was a little bit, little bit of a help in his, in his career. Uh, he, uh, he, he apologized at, at his farewell address. It was an assembly like this uh, for not paying more attention to the He spent most of his time uh, develop, uh, organizing, developing the regional uh, record centers. But he left Boehmer pretty much in charge. They, they worked very closely together. They, they came from the National Archives during the war. Uh, they, they, they went to the uh, War Department and became records managers uh, uh, during, the, uh, during World War II and then returned. Uh, Grover, uh, there was apologies. I happen to know that he, that he was a great help to the staff. He protected the staff against the uh, McCarthy inquisitions and even protected uh, a member of the staff on whom I knew very well, uh, who a policeman reported that he's homosexual. And Wayne Grover's reply was, I don't like entitlement. You mean I'm one enticement? of the few people who knew that story at all. You said enticement? Huh? Enticement. Uh, that the policeman had enticed him. I, I know the circumstances, but that's beside the point. Uh, but uh, Grover thought it was an, he didn't approve of enticement, and he did nothing about uh, the staff member who was married and had, had a family. Uh, but uh, Boehmer uh, was a very good manager. He wasn't, he, he uh, got, uh, he went to, he was, from, he was from North Dakota, got a degree from uh, uh, Colorado University and, and studied in also in California. Uh, he was a good manager, he didn't produce any uh, scholarly works, uh, but uh, what, what the archives needed at that point was a good manager, and Boehmer was a good manager, didn't always agree with him, but he was a su supporter uh, in this whole deal with, with electronic records. He, when I told him when, about electronic records, he immediately uh, gave me uh, p permission uh, to, uh, discuss, to, to work out, to figure out what to do with electronic records. So we worked, uh, so he had a committee, since I, was, I wasn't at the proper level, 
the chairman of the committee was Ev Aldrich, the, the assistant uh, archivist for records management. But we, we worked closely together and developed the electronic re records the, uh, division. And I'm tempted to say, which brings us back to Dome. Huh? Um, so are there any last words since, no? Anybody? Are there any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, before the magic time comes, let's talk a little bit about how one advances in the agency and how you advanced. Was it? Advancement. For me? For, for you. And uh, have, when, when by the time you left, had advancement opportunities become regularized? You went, was it American University, to, to take additional classes? Yeah. Was yeah. there anyone who basically told you how you could advance in the agency? No, uh, you know, uh, I had a, my luck up, up to uh, the age of 24, my luck was all bad. Uh, but, but from then on, when I, starting with the census, but coming to the archives, my, my luck was all good. So the most important thing, I think, is just pure luck. I had luck, I, uh, a, a lucky, uh, incident after I was in the archives in just a week and a half. Uh, and uh, I kept asking for promotions and they kept telling me I'm um, uh, uh, academically unqualified. Uh, and every once in a while they told me I was a dead end, but uh, I, I didn't accept that. Uh, uh, that would have been, that's not, that's pretty much now impossible. Walt Robertson, uh, who was executive director of the National Archives, said that uh, my career w would, would now be impossible. Okay, so, uh, you know, Ernst Posner was a refugee scholar. Yeah. What impact did he have on your career, and how did you, in effect, become his successor? Well, uh, uh, I didn't know who Ernst Posner was at my level. I, I signed up immediately at American University because they told me I had to have American history. I may have met him briefly. I probably wouldn't know who he was. Uh, I took his, his one-year course. At that, up to that time, I thought that the National Archives, when they talked about uh, professional archivists, I just don't believe it. It's, it's just a, uh, a job that you have, that you learn on the job, because that was my experience. But when I went to Ernst Posner's course, he started out by saying, archives is the second oldest profession. And that, cha that pretty much changed my mind. And I, actually, in one of my publications, I referred to a business archives that dated from about 1500 BC. And it was he that told me I have to accept that position to, to, to go to, uh, to Italy as a, a chairman of the task force that became a committee. So I was chairman of the committee on, International Committee on, on Automation for eight years met in Europe and met in Africa. You know, in terms of women at the archives and minorities, oh. do you think that uh, the archives gave minorities and women an even break? Yeah, I think going around to agencies, I think uh, the National Archives record is, is pretty, is, is good. Uh, the prayer and preservation uh, was highly prejudiced. They, they were all white. Uh, but. Uh, there was there, there was a, a number of sub professionals that when I came uh, in Lewinson's division, uh, we had a sub professional. Uh, she unfortunately she wasn't uh, wasn't very good at the job, but I, I covered for her. Uh, but uh, they, they did pretty well, and uh, the fact that they were able to, to hire uh, Harold Pinkett, uh, and uh, there was. Uh, Sarah Jackson, I don't know if that name is familiar to you, she was the expert on, on, on uh, military records. I, I still remember uh, a, a Southern professor saying, 
I told my wife, I'm in love with Sarah Jackson. Uh, uh, besides that, uh, there was Jimmy Walker, who started out at, as a messenger and became a leading authority uh, on ge genealogical uh, sources, uh, became nationally known professional genealogist would say, I want to see Jimmy Walker first. Uh, he was a very nice guy and a hard worker. There was one other uh, who was pr promoted to become head of the FDR library. They selected him in, uh, uh, rather than uh, Harold Pinkett, who should have gotten the job. They, they picked someone who, who wouldn't make waves. A nice guy, but he wouldn't make waves. Well, let's end by talking about the union at the archives. Huh? Do you think the union has been beneficial for the National Archives, and in what way? The union? You're right. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's kind of a funny situation. I don't know if you the, the, uh, the, the, it was Bob Boehmer who started the, arc, started the union. And of course, he, he had to resign when, when he became a deputy archivist. And after he left, the, the union declined. Uh, it was, the the u union leader was Catherine Murphy, who was anti, imagine a president of a union who was anti-union. She was protecting her own job. She spent, she was a lot of fun, very, very good sense of humor, and actually pretty bright. But she spent more time in the bathroom uh, putting on her makeup to, to cover her age than she spent actually working so she became president of the union to protect herself. Well, perhaps that's not the right note to leave. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, <laughs> but I think, uh, and we must, I really appreciate all of you yeah. having come. And uh, I especially appreciate you, Meyer, being willing to share your, your knowledge. So thank you very much. And thank you, and thank you for inviting me. It's, it's good to be an archivist again for an hour. So, <clears throat> would you like some, some, oh, some water?